It's always funny because there's some people in my audience or uh, maybe the extended audience that know me as an artist or other people who know me as a podcaster or a writer or whatever it happens to be. Um, and now after, you know, 10 years <laughs> doing this art and tech style of work, uh, it's funny to encounter new audiences that don't know what you did in the past. So I do a, a whole variety of things. I run an arts organization in New York called Do Not Research. I have a podcast stream. I'm a Twitch streamer. Uh, I've also shown in galleries, museums uh, for like 10 years uh, in this gutter of art and tech. And yeah, I've been uh, publishing everything is under my name across all of the platforms, but there's a variety of interdisciplinary work. Yeah. So like the reason that I found you was actually, I think, was through your Twitch streams. And then I went through like a bit of a rabbit hole of, of your work that I found really, really interesting. And the fact that like, it seems to me that you may have like started in academia, but were sort of maybe like limited by kind of what were considered like the bounds of what was like good things to study within academics. And so you kind of moved into niche online communities. And I thought that was that was really interesting. Could you talk a bit about about that maybe? Yeah, sure, sure. The uh, What most people probably know me for currently is that I've spent the last few years interviewing Gen Z political meme posters and studying these arcs of politicization, radicalization that happen online. So I'll talk to a 13-year-old meme poster, followed this person now for many years, various interviews, uh, collaborative projects, some in some cases books published together. And then after you know six years in these spaces of 24-7 running discords, exchanging radical reading materials, posting memes, uh, everything on social media. In some cases, they found new political organizations or they join existing political organizations. And uh, that kind of sustained uh, attention in this space, these stories are actually really, really unique. Uh, when you see someone enter through um, the soft power and the influence of silly, you know, 600 pixel JPEG memes that they're posting onto Instagram. And then they join or make a real meaningful commitment. In some cases, they pay membership dues, they raise money, they do uh, mutual aid groups, all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, those are, those are interesting stories now of how young people are being politicized. So uh, what those things usually come down to that you can uncover in these in-depth interviews is that at some particular moment when this person was ready to hear a new narrative about how the world was pieced together and organized, they came across a YouTube video by complete chance, and it changed the course of their political evolution. And so the process is through these lengthy, in-depth interviews about political imaginaries and online influences of podcasts and content creators and memes and uh, all of these characters, uh, what were those moments where they took a fork in the road that then led them to where they are? So tracing that path has been, I think, the the bulk of the work that I've been publishing in the last few years. Yeah. So like the 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 book that I that I know that you uh, published was called Politogram and the Post Left, ex which sort of explores these different esoteric uh, online uh, political beliefs and groups. I think, um, but I mean, what I can't even imagine what that is like because you have to have. I mean, I guess depending on the group that you're in, you have to have a little bit of tough skin um, to be able to handle <laughs> like, I, I don't know, I mean, like these type of like young people who maybe feel very strongly about things that you may feel are just like, you know, maybe like absolutely disgusting or just like unbelievable things to and and also still like take them seriously as as research <laughs> subjects, I guess. <laughs> but like, how did you I mean, do you have any tips for people to like be able to grow that uh, that thick skin? <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, it comes with the territory. It's um, if you don't have it, you won't be able to last in these spaces because everyone is constantly roasting each other all the time. Um, I will say though, for all of the, you know, fringe conspiracy adjacent reactionary stuff that I've like in the last few years put myself out on a ledge to like 
you know, defend the uh, confused political leanings of like a young teenager who's at risk for really bad ideas on the internet and say that, you know, these people can be effectively counter message to uh, the responsibility of the left is to provide an alternative interpretation and win them over, you know, to engage in debate and, and bring these people to your side. Um, of all of those questionable people that I've put my reputation at stake to defend, the one thing that I have been attacked the most for is involvement with blockchain. Really? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, by like orders of magnitude. It's really funny to see, you know, what uh, provokes the the response and the backlash. Um, yes, but uh, generally, I think by participating in this space, you accumulate a thick skin over time that comes with scale. And, um, you know, anyone who's in content creation, I think, uh, has has to learn this eventually. Uh, certainly the meme posters learn it very early on because they're looking to provoke an outrage and, you know, uh, uh, create something that irritates and then goes viral and spreads through the network. So they develop those responses pretty quickly. Yeah, I think I... I developed my thick skin, I think, because I mean, I'm I'm definitely a child of the internet. So like, I I think my first like real like uh, I guess platform that I was really addicted to, or like um, I don't know, website was Nintendo forums. <laughs> to be honest, I was a kid, oh, wow. I was like really into Nintendo <laughs> and really into Super yeah. Smash Brothers. And like the Super Smash Brothers community is like a very it can also be a quite intense intense one. <laughs> um, of course. And so like I was there, you know, like super young. I mean, just like we just get into like the dumbest fights with people about like you know who, who what is the next character that that they should put into like the newest super smash brothers game like as if we had any power to do any of that <laughs> like, like as, as if internet uh, nintendo gave a single shit about any of our opinions <laughs> and we just get into like the most like intense debates that become so personal so fast um yeah there's a style of arguing on the internet that uh privileges the communication networks, the style of posting and all of these things and has nothing to do with a truthful claim, but uh, can be amplified just through like, oh, damn, that was a really good burn. <laughs> I was like, that comment was really strong. <laughs> He's not going to come back from this. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's funny because these things begin as jokes, but then, um, you know, my thought is that post 2012 with the mass adoption of Facebook and these social media platforms is that any young person who goes into a political organization is going to have necessarily passed through social media at some point. So what we're seeing in uh, various subcultures of all kinds that were maybe not specifically on the internet, but now all take place over social media is that the old cultural uh, you know, the certain privileges and affordances, the stylistic qualities of internet banter, memes, phrases, things like this are kind of working their way into subcultures of all kinds, right? Just purely by the fact that they, they take place online now. And so there's a certain political uh, teleology to that, which is, you know, this infinite nichification of online subcultures that... Um, seems to be playing out right now on social media. And there's all different tendencies that are flourishing that, you know, in the case of the left, uh, rehatch all of these, one might say, outdated uh, debates of things that happened 100 years ago, but uh, leftists and historians love to infinitely uh, rehash and debate and so on and so forth. So yeah, my sense is that while these things begin as jokes in many cases, uh, the influence of the internet onto political organization is going to be quite substantial uh, in the years fo moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it, it already is, it seems to me. I mean, just like, it's clear that every uh, political organization that 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 i'm aware of uses social media in some capacity to organize this or that events um for whatever reason well i mean i think it's going to get i think it's going to get weirder than that because there's a <laughs> yeah you know, maybe <laughs> well, yeah. let's say like there's an analogy of like okay so you run an organization and then you have a, a email list or you have a listserv or something like that and um it, the internet can be used as outreach but in that case, you're kind of, I'm borrowing this from uh, Lil Internet uh, of the New Models podcast. He described an inflection point that happened, I think, some point during the 2010s, uh, where previously people would upload their lives onto the internet. 
And now we tend to download our lives off of the internet. There's a reverse of this polarity. And so I'm, I'm more interested now in kind of extrapolating out these curves where political organizations can form from online communities and they kind of do the reverse. So there could be in the case of a content creator that has a, a you know, especially wide reach that the most active people of those following uh, of that following then collect in a discord. And then within the discord, they have an IRL meetup channel. And then these people go and they canvas together or they stage a protest or they stage some type of, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, a scene. I think, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, the the implications of this are actually quite dangerous because right. you get a bunch of radicalized people who then go out and do some kind of dangerous stunt, um, and and we've seen that quite a bit through the last through uh, uh, several years. And a lot of these people are quite young; they're very politically active, they're extremely dedicated to a cause, and they've been into it for just a few years. Um, so, you know, th these things are are quite novel in how they've politicized people and their their developments. So, uh, I'm interested to see what of these things will be able to survive and the type of politics they have are extremely weird and like cooked in the gutter of the internet, you know? Right. So like, uh, this is our... I, MAGA I, tankies, <laughs> exo-proletariat, you know, the mecha peasantry, just like shit that's totally wild and made up. Right. So like, this is this is like a bit awkward for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Being like the person who started uh, the crypto leftists uh, group. But like... There you go. Um... <laughs> But before we before we get to that weird stuff, I like so this is what you would call I think you call it ideologies. So yeah, uh, so yeah. I guess that is specific to like instead of you are putting your political beliefs onto the or Im importing your political beliefs onto the internet and using it, you're sort of creating your political beliefs through interactions over the internet. If that make like in that direction, yeah, that they're sense. they're jamming together. Uh, like A B pairings, right? So, let, well, let me just give a few like examples crypto that and leftism. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've done I've done a series of flags that are um, representations of these various ideologies, like email uh, ideology, and you get things like monarcho syndicalism is my favorite, which is a, an alliance between the crown and the uh, the organized trade unions against the emergent merchant class. Um, you get things like a narco primitivist caliphatism, libertarian neo-monarchism. Maybe that one is actually uh, a little more present now than than a joke. Um, there's there's all shades of like queer anarcho transhumanism. Um, I'm just running through the flags in my head, uh, you know, Catholic distributism, who else is in there? Uh, th there's there's a whole variety of shades of basically people pairing together different descriptors to come up with a, uh, you know, uh, individual ideology as like a personal brand, more or less, right? How do you set yourself apart from the crowd? And, um, you know, uh, branding is always part of politics, having some kind of appeal, but there's something especially characteristic of these ideologies that feels tailored to web two social media where when you find the right combination of incongruent pairings that it then explodes into a viral sensation so um there's been a few of those that are rather more inflammatory uh especially in the taboo corners of the internet and these things um you know sometimes have a like a relatively mainstream audience in that a fringe Twitter personality can be brought onto a mainstream talk show and, uh, you know, get a chance to air their views. And, you know, in that sense, like the, the internet is actually doing a, a pretty big impact onto shaping the discourse that you have a, you know, kind of random internet political radical who is then getting an audience of, uh, I don't know, 50 million people on Tucker Carlson. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's been, it's been weird seeing like, I don't know, there was also that incident of like the R slash anti-work like moderator on mm. like, um, I think it was Fox or something like that. Um, but seeing kind of like, you know, people make the joke, Twitter, Twitter isn't real life or whatever like that. But then it's sort of, yeah, the direction seems to be shifting like the other way in like a kind of uncomfortable way, I think, for people. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yeah. But yeah, so like, you know, the awkward question then is for me, like, is is crypto left i don't know how much you've like necessarily looked into like the, the like this community um but is crypto leftism an ideology because it is i mean 
I, I, when I made up the word, I was like, well, I mean, and same with the name of my podcast. I was like, well, I like this thing and I like this thing. What happens if I put it together? Um, <laughs> and so like, like in, in, and while I was doing that, I was like completely like, please keep in mind, I'm aware. I'm like, this is weird as fuck. Like, why am I doing this? And like, <laughs> like, I wish I wasn't this weird, <laughs> but I like really felt like I needed to do it. Um, so yeah, so in some ways, whereas like, I think a lot of the examples that you gave, are for me very strange like pairings of things that seem completely incompatible in in real life uh, i can imagine a lot of people probably feel the same way about about uh crypto leftism you know whatever that is i never really i never really defined it i just you know just looking at crypto through a left-wing po political lens but well i think what you find in some of these cases is that these the pairing of belief systems that seem incongruous if they seem incongruous, you later uncover unexpected ways in which they reinforce each other. And uh, that yields new insights that uh, you, you might not have had otherwise. So it's kind of like looking at, um, you know, a, a random Im image generation or a Rorschach, and then you kind of put the meaning onto it. And uh, it helps to like, you know, spur all sorts of like creative uh, insights and innovation and and whatever. So um yeah, I think those things are actually very, very useful. And I think we do have a real um, we do have a real problem now in how our our political landscape is divided, which uh, I've spent a lot of time on this in the last few years, where uh, a certain issue will be sliced in one way, and um, you know, this is a right wing issue, that is a left wing issue, and they're actually, on the really on the wrong side of the discourse and people end up seeding what should be very contested territory competing for the people who are interested or care about that topic and instead they're just uh nope anybody who touches that is uh you know they're they're evil they're part of the other side they're beyond help and then we shouldn't outreach we shouldn't have outreach to them and that's I've, I've tried to uh, make the case that that is a catastrophic mistake and that is where you need to sp be spending most of your attention because that's where you can actually win over the hearts and minds of the coalition you're trying to build. Uh, particularly in the case of the left in the United States, uh, we've had a lot of problems with that recently. And um, as evidenced by social media, many people have become politicized into very right-leaning ideas, uh, I think mistakenly so. And... Um, you know, I am tempted to rephrase uh, the current regime of neoliberalism in the United States as a type of ideology itself, because it is riddled with contradictions, right? So if you were to say, uh, you know, uh, woke mass incarcerationism, uh, that would not be an inaccurate description of American neoliberalism, right? Like there's there's all sorts of, um, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, rugged individualist oligarchic bailoutism. Like that, that is an existing reality and it is, right. it is riddled with contradictions itself. So um, I think what is most interesting is to kind of take the contentious position that some of these teenagers have useful insights more than they're producing ideological garbage and detritus. And there's something to be learned from that. You know, once you step outside of your own political reality and into someone else's, you can then bring back some insights. It really does shift the way that you think. And um, especially in the case of young people playing with these symbols on social media. Um, I think the, to just, to just state it outright, uh, they're looking down the barrel of, uh, some pretty disastrous political consequences, environmental consequences within their lifetime. So they're very incentivized to come up with a new way of organizing society. And maybe these games of like personal branding and pairing political prefixes and suffixes are an attempt to solve like what is that missing thing like what what needs to happen you know uh, previous revolutions twentieth century experiments with socialism failed there's not much to be optimistic for so people are kind of they're they're mining all of political history and then they're jamming together things that seem kind of interesting to come up with a solution <laughs> yeah yeah indeed that's that's a really interesting way of putting it yeah I guess um when you're looking like seeing no optimistic future, then you might as well like, or no optimistic, like maybe like group to join or like uh, political organization to be a part of, then you might as well make one up <laughs> and exactly. like hope that it's yeah, better. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, sometimes I, I, I hear this a lot. Like this is something I've 
you really notice. I mean, before I was starting with when I before I started the blog and the podcast, I never really used Twitter. Um, but then when I started using Twitter, I just noticed like some of the like most ridiculous combinations I felt of like of sim <laughs> of, of symbols like on their on their usernames and like yeah you know on, on their tags and like and then you could like kind of see if you like go through their Twitter like kind of like this weird uh like actual group of people who all kind of like found each other with their weird niche thing <laughs> that they're into um yeah, and they yeah. all found each other on Twitter and that was and that like uh to me like I remember um or, or I mean I wasn't I, I didn't see it myself but like you know Bill Gates had talked about like you know when he was in trying to introduce the internet on these like late night shows being like you like you can find people with like the same niche interest and it's like like now we're in that reality like we're in that reality to the extreme yes yes absolutely it's i mean it, it is in some ways it's a very positive development for um a kind of decentralized political think tank of coming up with all wacky <laughs> solutions yeah, yeah. Uh, and in some cases there's you know this is effective at producing the the discourse but it certainly does it is just tinged with all of the weird peculiarities of like web to social media where everybody is trying to like carve out some extremely mm. niche thing that is inflammatory in the right way that then amplifies it, you know, a thousand fold yeah. and it turns into a viral sensation. Yeah. I, I think, and <laughs> this is still super awkward for me because I think a lot of people see me that way. <laughs> and I feel like I've inadvertently become that person when I don't really like necessarily want to be. <laughs> Well, let's, it's, it's hard. Let's it's hard for me in. to like disentangle <laughs> myself from that reality, though. Let me. I'll read you one here. This is just. I was trying to pull up a good example that came to mind recently, but this one reads: Leninist, Ron Paulist, Maoism within monarchist America. So <laughs> you know, crypto leftism is, uh, I think, okay. relatively towards the the center of the Overton window compared <laughs> to this. Like, I mean, it's a mouthful. It's a paragraph of a political label. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I definitely try to. I think because I was aware of this tendency to happen, I was I tried to keep it as open as possible and not not too specific in one direction or another, since I feel like it's usually not very helpful. Well, I saw from you, actually, I think this was maybe yesterday or the day before, but uh, a certain quote from Professor Richard Wolff about <laughs> DAOs that was like, wow, this was not what I expected to see. But, um, you know, I think that is kind of evidence of the thing is that when you jam these terms together, you do produce unexpected insights. And, uh, you know, I, I think that there is, you know, some real opportunity to create cooperative structures that the left has always sought to do. And uh, this would seem to be a very frictionless infrastructure to uh, create some of those organizations. So uh, there are real potentials to it. And it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, that it comes from what is largely like a, a libertarian and kind of monetarist uh, uh, ideology, ideology or rhetorical discursive background, right? That's the language within which all this stuff is wrapped, but other opportunities exist within it. Yeah. So in, in case people didn't didn't see it, um, on for some reason in Yahoo, uh, <laughs> Professor Wolf <laughs> said in an interview um, that, quote, the advent of blockchain technology and DAOs could be a way to achieve a genuine democratic control over the means of production. Um, and of course, I, I retweeted it with that quote because I was also extremely surprised that he said something like that since he had, he had made comments before and I had written about it, um, what he had said. And it was just obvious he just like didn't know that much about it and was just kind of like, you know, rolling with whatever um, most others' opinions was on uh, or are on, on the left anyways. Um, but it does like, I mean, it, 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 it caused uh, friction, like with a lot of like, a, like there are already like other left wing content creators now who are like, oh, no, like, Professor Wolf, what are you doing? Like, what, what shitty grad student convinced you about this or whatever? Um, well, if I can, I, I do have I do have a thought on this that like, I mean, yeah. I'd be interested to hear, because I think you probably have this experience a lot, but like, spending a lot of time in left wing circles, there's you know, a real hesitancy. We went through, you know, at this point, many, many decades of uh, extreme defeat and the belief systems that grow out of that are often, honestly, just ways of coping with long-term defeat where you have to, uh, you know, 
I'm empathetic, but it is it is immensely frustrating because um, there's a real reluctance on the left to do it to have a serious engagement with economic topics. Period. Just across the board, and people tend to live in a totally uh, fictitious, you know, made up belief system that everybody's going to do everything for free and we're all just going to get along and participate and share. And, you know, everything should be uploaded onto the internet for free. And you should like, you know, create all of these structures of, uh, just like being basically a, an unpaid community service servant in every aspect of your life. And I mean, that is, quite explicitly the ideology of these, as I refer to it in the essay, the techno-feudalist Web2 platforms that want you to do all that stuff for free. Uh, th this is a very kind of necrotic, toxic belief system. And I think people, as a way of coping with the impossibility of any sort of victory, the economic topics have just receded from the conversation. And so if you look back at older periods of the left, and I mean, honestly, even the period that like our parents grew up in, wages, the percent of the surplus value you create, how much of that do you actually get back through your wages, uh, that has like kind of disappeared in favor of this idea that everybody should work for free all of the time. And the hesitance to discuss any uh, topic of like, who gets what share of the pie of all the valuable things that we produce is now the thing that perpetuates this extreme, extreme inequality in creative economies. Uh, you know, so it's a it's a real um, it's a cultural problem on the left, especially in the field of uh, creative economies that now has cascading influences throughout everything else. And uh, to think that people should be compensated for their work is now, I think, in some cases, a very uh, <laughs> uh, unfavored idea among these left wing circles, you know, and, and that is what crypto forces you to do. Like it forces you to talk about what is the value being exchanged between all these uh, parties. And, um, you know, I mean, I think Richard Wolf, I'm actually quite happy to hear this quote from him because he spent a, quite a bit of time, you know, over the, the past 10 years talking about um, building worker cooperative structures, which is, um, I think, agreed upon by many people at this point after, you know, a long history of like failed 20th century experiments that like within the structures of capitalism, you can have, uh, worker cooperatives where people own uh, equity in the company, they get a percentage of the profits, those things can exist within capitalism as it currently stands, and then can potentially build a path outwards. So I think that's a really positive development. And, you know, I'm interested to see where, where he goes with some of those things. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we'll see whether or not Richard Wolff's opinion uh, changes anybody's thoughts <laughs> on the, when it comes to these things. Um, one of the other things I really wanted to get to, because I think it's also related to probably the research, well, it is like the research that you have been doing, um, but to, to what we're talking about when it comes to like these kind of strange mixtures of uh, of ideologies and then also the idea that of kind of like people, what people do is sort of different than necessarily what people say or what they what they think they're doing necessarily. Um, and it's the research that you did on these sort of MMO RPG guilds mm. in like things like World of Warcraft or I think maybe a, a different game, but similar. Um, but how these guilds of of people who play this game will sort of like govern themselves uh, through a system called uh, DKP or Dragon Kill Points. And sort of the, the conclusion that you came up with in that research was that a lot of these guilds were practicing a kind of type of market socialism, even though like probably if you asked any of those you know, nerds, if they were doing market <laughs> socialism, they would be like, hell no, you know, like, they would be like, I don't do communism. Are you kidding me? Like, that doesn't make market <laughs> social. Like, it would probably be like, you probably get the most ridiculous reaction uh, from these people. But yeah, I was wondering if you can maybe go a bit through that research and like, yeah, because it, it was it was super interesting when I when I read it. Yeah, the um, let's see, I think the best uh, condensation of this idea is a video I did for Dis. Um, and actually, you can see this one on YouTube, and then the rest of the series is hosted on dis.art. But the title of that video 
Uh, I think I've written this out. I've done it as a podcast. And then the video is the most condensed form of it, uh, which was a collaboration with uh, LA-based filmmaker Jacob Hurwitz Goodman. The title of this piece is DKP is Market Socialism. And this is a little bit of a provocation, but um, if you haven't spent a lot of time playing WoW or in other MMO guilds, um, DKP is essentially a loot system. So you have, you're faced with this problem where you have... Uh, say 20 to 40 people collaborating on going into this dungeon to kill a boss. The boss is going to drop four to five pieces of loot. And then you have to, you're faced with this problem of how do you distribute the scarce resources because there's not enough loot for everyone. There's only five people who can get it. Uh, and so there's various solutions for that. Um, some of which for casual organizations, they just do a lottery ticket type of thing where they, they pick a random number, that person wins it. There's other types of tiered memberships to these organizations. But, you know, let's keep in mind that if you're raiding in World of Warcraft, you're playing for probably three to six hours a week for like a year, <laughs> you know, like this is a pretty lengthy commitment. Like I think uh, one day a week is kind of uncommon. Two days a week is the minimum. Some guilds do three days a week. So these things really, really, uh, the hours total up to be quite, quite a hefty commitment at the end. And, um, you know, those structures, if there's extreme inequality within the organization, they're not very durable. So to get people to have a you know, group of people who routinely show up on time are actively incentivized to participate. There's got to be some type of relatively equitable distribution of the resources so that everyone feels like they stand a decent chance to go and get the thing that they want from this dungeon. Um, the system that is most time tested and durable is something called DKP, which stands for Dragon Kill Points. And um, this is. Let me describe how uh, let me describe how the system works because it's I think if you haven't played these games it might be a little bit abstract. You get a small reward for showing up on time. Every time you kill a boss, you get an additional reward. So everybody's getting paid, you know, ten DKP to show up, fifteen DKP for each boss you kill. Uh, there's also every fifteen minutes you're getting a tiny little you know like five points of DKP. So you're getting paid for good performance, killing the boss, for uh, showing up on time, for staying until the end, being prepared with all the gear and the resources you need, all the consumables for when you go to raid. And then there's also a wage at 15 minute increments. So everyone is being compensated for their labor uh, by, by the clock, but then also an additional bonus for good performance. So everybody across the board is incentivized to play their best in this case. Nobody is phoning it in and you know letting someone else carry the, do the heavy lifting and so on. So uh, when the loot drops and you have four to five pieces from this boss, you then enter a bidding system within which the points that were rewarded to people for time, attendance, and boss kills then are used in this bidding war to see who wants to pay the most for this plus 50 healing mace or who wants to pay the most for this uh, de dexterity dagger or whatever the item happens to be. And those in turn are distributed through the use case that, you know, if you are a rogue, you're going to bid on the dexterity dagger. But if you're a mage, you can't bid on the dexterity dagger. You are literally not allowed. Uh, and there's certain items that it's, it's a bit complicated in World of Warcraft because there's a uh, internal mechanism called soulbound, which prevents players from trading things in certain cases. But absent that, even the uh, items that are not soulbound that you could just take out of the collaborative rating environment and then bring to the auction house to realize its value in cash or, or in gold, um, people who are not going to use that item are not allowed to bid on the on the thing. So there's actually very few ways in which you can uh, harness the productive power of that organization and then capture its value in gold or in capital and the currency of the game outside of the cooperative organization of the guild. All of the value produced by the guild is distributed to the members themselves or to someone individually. And um, it seems to me like that is uh, more or less exactly a workers' cooperative rather than as a lot of these, you know, 
angsty, uh, you know, in many cases, very far right leaning gamers would describe their politics, right? It's like, oh, um, have you considered that you're actually doing a functioning socialist economy in your guild? And they would fucking absolutely freak out. It's like, what? I, I'm not gay. No. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? Like, it, I mean, I've, I've played with these people for years and years. I mean, the things that they say are uh, obscene and, and disgusting, but uh, they're actually under their they they're in a working uh cooperative model that has like you know all the surplus value remains within the community and it is quite an extraordinary thing so this is to to bring back this long arc of the topic i think that uh very often people say x and do y and so the structural analysis of what's actually taking place versus how people describe it because if you talk to these gamers, they would very often say like, yeah, I'm like the best rogue. I've got the highest DPS. My crits are out of, out of control. I'm like top of the charts. I'm like obviously the best player. And then, um, you know, if you like uh, they would describe themselves very much as being in competition with the other the other players without any sharing of resources. And uh, there's just a very clear disconnect between the rhetoric they say and the actual economic activity that's going on. So uh, I'm always looking for those opportunities. I think there's some kind of analogy that you can draw between these very libertarian leaning communities that uh, discuss crypto and blockchain and so on. And, you know, they they end up accidentally inventing these structures where all of the members of the community can equally own a portion of the organization or the product or whatever it is. And that is you know, structurally much more similar to a workers' cooperative than it is some um, bootstrapping anarcho-capitalist startup or whatever. So I'm always looking for those opportunities. Yeah. So like, just to go back to to like the the research with the um, with the DKP, I think what is also similar, you know, similar comparison is that I mean, you have like the joke on the left of like. I don't know, uh, gaming, gaming, there will be no more gaming, like after the revolution or like, you know, just like people who just like, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> people who are just like kind of, uh, I mean, as a joke a bit, I think, but I think they're just trying to poke at the, uh, the just like the, the tendency for like people who game or to consider themselves gamers to be all, like always like extremely like right wing chuds or whatever. Like, I think what was interesting about your work is that if you look a little bit deeper at sort of like what they're actually doing, if you're looking at the, you know, how does it work and what do they do? that looks different than like the aesthetics that they portray, which is maybe like, yes. you know, them saying curse words or, you know, making fun of your mom or whatever, like when they're, when they're talking with each other. Um, so like, if I think that's that this, there's this, some reason it's like cultural thing among the left is just sort of like, I mean, one, not having a bit, maybe like the thick skin to be in these types of communities, which is like tough. I can understand. Um, but also just like purely focusing on aesthetics as like the yes. the thing that defines like what is what is yes political what is their political ideology like something it is gaming is right wing for for some people exactly yeah. exactly yeah and it's um i think it's a pretty devastating indictment when the far right creates functioning models of a socialist economy and the left can't <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, I think like the, that, the secret that is says to a not, lot about the contemporary left. The, the, the secret is maybe not to think of it as as socialism or just like <laughs> don't even politicize it and somehow you reach <laughs> socialism. Somehow. That's I mean, but, that is that's the curious thing is that yeah. many times when you're in like a rhetorical or ideological vacu vacuum, you're often open to economic experimentation that you don't explicitly identify as coming under a certain political label. And there's an interesting example of this. This is from a little while ago, so I'm going to, I'm not going to nail the um, exact location, but um, in various um, deindustrialized red states in the US, there's been a few examples of local towns and cities uh, essentially like nationalizing their supermarkets that were going out of business. So there's, I mean, it's, it's quite an, an odd uh, situation, but, um, you know, the alternatives were that the store that has been there for a few decades or is maybe owned by a family in the town, um, those uh, those stores are just really being outcompeted by Walmart. They're not able to operate at a profit. Uh, and so the alternative is to either just let them go out of business and everybody has to shop at Walmart, or you can just take over the 
uh, the store, run it as a municipal grocery store. The employees of the grocery store literally become employees of the city where they get the health insurance and the wages and, you know, comparable to uh, clerks and postal workers and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, there's been, I think, you know, four or five examples of that happening in the U.S., especially post-pandemic. Um, a few people have remarked on this, but uh, if you were to look structurally at what they're doing, they're socializing the grocery store, right? Like, and this is like, these are, you know, very conservative, often very religious, you know, communities that are allergic to the idea, the word socialism, um, but because they don't explicitly conceive of it as having those attachments or implications, they're very open to this economic model, and they prefer the way that it works. So, I mean, I think those those present some weird opportunities. Uh, and having done so much work about how people become politicized and like, uh, you know, slowly drift into their ideas over time. Um, these are moments that are, I think, really interesting for me. There is this like kind of awkward question. I think sometimes that some when you're on the left for enough time and you see these things kind of happen over and over again, where some like bright eyed communist tries to go and like do X, Y, Z thing and just fails miserably. And part of the reason that you maybe are somewhat uncomfortable with maybe admitting is that some people just turned off by the yeah. label. They're yeah. just turned off by like the fact that <clears throat> you said true. the word socialism or whatever. So like maybe you should have just done it in a way that was like not explicitly political, but then you have, I don't know, people who are more gung ho about the labels that they say like, no, 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 we have to be like explicit, like we need to say that we are the communist party of whatever. And we need to like proceed with that. So I think like to me, it's um, it's a tough question. So like people have also commented to me about like ask. the title yeah, of, my, yeah. of my platform that that they're like, why did you call yourself like I like you can't call yourself that because like that's you know too people don't like the word socialism just like pretend you know. But but I was also at the time I was like, what the fuck else am I gonna call myself? I had like no, I just had no creativity at that moment. I was like, I knew the two things, and I was like, I I was like hoping that I would come up with a better well, name. Well, I think and I just there, never did. there's, it's got to kind of do two things where it's like, you need to propel the branding by pairing together things that are like curious combinations. But then uh, there's also yeah, a risk yeah. when you have something that like, you know, snag someone's attention that uh, that can be inflammatory and turn other people off. So, I mean, we're constantly trying to do this balance of like essentially controversy marketing in ad driven media that, that that really kind of you know propels these things uh beyond it's like the only choice right, you have right. <laughs> honestly like i feel sometimes it's like what else am i gonna do like no one else they're not gonna pay attention like if i was shadow wolf <laughs> exactly or whatever, yeah, like yeah <laughs> talking about this stuff like right, they wouldn't right. give a shit you know they especially what, you, what are your thoughts shit. though <laughs> on saying like um like explicitly identifying with political labels if you're trying to, because I, I know that you have a lot of conversations across different political divides similar to what I do, but um, do you, does it become like a hurdle for you to have socialist explicitly in the name? Are people like, I'm not going to talk to this guy because, you know, he, he's, he's on socialism. He doesn't understand the real economy, you know, like <laughs> my Milton Friedman shit. Uh, I would say that I mean, whenever, if I, if you mean like, if when I reach out to someone, if I, to ask them to do an interview or something like that, usually I know more or less where their politics kind of lies. And I, I mean, I've never had someone reply that like, I would never go on a socialist show or something like that. I think, but I also like kind of highly curate who I ask to come on because I'm just not going to ask like everyone to come on. And I, like, there are only so many people who are kind of left-leaning in the crypto world. Well, I maybe I should clarify. I have heard people say to me, looking at your title, that e like blockchain socialist, uh, either this guy doesn't understand what the blockchain is or doesn't understand what socialism is. And I was like, actually, you yeah, don't yeah, understand yeah, sure. either. The that. person who's telling me this comment has a very brittle grasp of either of those concepts, which is, I think, what you can intuit through like comparing these things. It's actually, it's, it's very generative and useful. Um, yeah, yeah, no, you must get that endlessly uh, <laughs> flame war <laughs> online, yeah. <laughs> on on both sides, like, I mean, so like to give an example, I posted for like the, this interview from Richard Wolf in the r slash cryptocurrency subreddit, which is also generally How'd a very like, right-leaning <laughs> uh, subreddit. And that was, it got, wow. it got a lot of attention. Like it was, I'm not like, surprised. I, it got like, uh, I don't know, I got a, I got a lot of upvotes. 
Um, but it also got like a shit ton of comments of people being like, you know, what the fuck? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, Karl Marx would never be for <laughs> decentralization. Like, Marx was for pure centralized, like central right, banks, right. like whatever, you know, centralized government. This is the antithesis of that. Um, this guy doesn't know what blockchain is. Um, or like blockchain is the epitome right, of free market right. capitalism. And then I also posted it on different, uh, on especially, I have like a long history with one uh, specific online community called r slash uh, socialist programmers. And they're especially negative about, um, Interesting. about cryptocurrency mm. or, or blockchains. And so they were also all like, uh, you know, any time my content has showed up has, has been just like the same thing, but from the opposite <laughs> side. So, yeah, and so like I always, it's always like a, a game of like trying to explain one side or the other side, depending on which. So I have like definitely my audience sometimes is a mix of people from these two two sides, like the crypto curious socialists or the socialist curious mm -hmm. crypto people. Yeah, I mean, there's few things that um, have elicited such a tremendous response from people on the internet, you know, of, of all the sensitive political topics that I've dipped into, it is, I think people are most allergic to the blockchain stuff. I, and I mean, I think it, in some cases, understandably so, because a lot of these things are just, uh, you know, uh, very annoying and like <laughs> technologically burdensome and, and whatever. But um, yeah, I, I do kind of feel like the need to have uh, an explicit, detailed conversation about what the breakdowns are especially within creative economies um this was made really really clear to me a few years ago from the art world you know which is my my background in this stuff where a lot of my peer group we came into that world um in the midst of a market bubble uh we didn't know that at the time i mean the kind of the writing was on the wall to be honest but um this was our first experience with it and so the idea that you could have graduated two years ago, and now you're living as a full-time artist off of the sales of your work. That was just, that was the only reality we knew. Uh, and that sustained for a few years where um, people who were making things that were unsellable and, you know, maybe got some traction online through a few blogs and tumblers and things like that, then became these immensely valuable artworks that were, you know, the, the degree to which their value increased could be, you know, more than a hundred fold in some cases, you know, so a, a painting that was unsellable. Are you, are you, are you talking about NFTs? Or? No, no, no. Well, I'm drawing an analogy. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I'm yeah. talking about in this case, physical paintings, uh, artworks of all sorts that would, you know, through the secondary market, like spike up to, uh, you know, one of our peers from this, uh, a Tumblr that we used to run back in like 20, let's say 11, 12 to 14. Um, his paintings went up to $100,000 on the secondary market and then immediately dropped off. But um, there's a classic example. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to, this guy's just, he's been through so much of having his uh, market spike up and down. But um, the classic example is that there's a painting that's traded between six collectors within a period of six months, which is initially purchased for $10,000, sells in the secondary market for $100,000 six months later. And then when it's put up for auction on the seventh time, it doesn't sell and the price crashes of all the work. So he's since recovered, has a career where he shows work, but the price has never reached that massive speculative, speculative valuation in the beginning. So all of those things are um, not unfamiliar to people who came from a background in the art world. Uh, you can, you know, watch the price of a rising asset and, you know, it's ups and downs and it's uh, uh, kind of insane. Um, but living with that reality several years later, I know a lot of people who bought houses or retired from that work. And then the people who, like myself and many of my peers, who did not capture a big slice of that value through the rising speculative asset, we work every day, all day, continue to grind out in the culture mines. And so if there had been, <laughs> um, you know, a split of like, even a fraction of a percent, you know, of like a 1% redistribution on collaborative projects that then, um, you know, later created these immensely valuable assets from individual artists rather than a group of people who had been collectively working on something, um, that money would have sustained many of my peer group in the, the 
years where the art market was a total bust. You know, even I've actually I've done the math on this quite a bit. Uh, th- like a one percent redistribution of some of these assets would have floated the entire group. So it's it is immensely immensely unequal. And you know now we see this explicitly with the NFTs because you can just look at the price; it's all public. In the art market, a lot of it happens behind closed doors, where something goes from four hundred dollars to forty thousand dollars, and you can just make more of them. And it's you know uh, there's no that a lot of these things are it's kind of unclear how big the addition is. Like, is this you know one of ten or one of a hundred? And and people are you know very opaque with that information. But in in the early years, there was. Um, the best example of this is a site called ArtRank, which would create a, um, you know, these are the hottest young painters to buy or the young sculptors or whoever else is doing well in the market uh, in a bracket of 10,000, 30,000, and 100,000. Uh, and what you would see is that they kind of updated every quarter or so. Part of what they would scrape to create that speculative valuation was the uh, social media impact of the work and the associated artists. So it is, you know, uh, just a, a true fact that our entire peer group, our online activity was crunched to create the speculative valuation for one individual's work. Uh, and so there is a fraction of that value that is that was produced by all the people who are, in some cases, literally collaboratively building artworks together in terms of like fabricating it with their hands. In other cases, coming up with the ideas and and things like this, or producing the essays that then became the legitimation of why this work is important, created the argument for it. Um, and so now looking back at those things, uh, it costs a lot of friendships and collaboration. Some people don't talk to each other anymore. Some people had to uh, move away from New York. Some people had to leave the country because you know it's it's kind of hard to rebuild your market after it increases tenfold and then crashes. That, that can end a lot of people's careers. Uh, it also saps them of the spirit of the desire to do art. Um, and so I just I look back at that period and I think if there had been some kind of more equitable split that everybody was attached to, like when this thing sells and resells, that everybody gets a, a tiny slice of that value, it would have prevented a lot of people from having gone bankrupt, having to leave the profession. And it would have made a lot of people happier and provided the right incentives to collaborate in the future. So I think there's real opportunities to do that stuff now, you know, and, and, and it's not happening. Yeah, so I mean, like, this is uh, also prevalent in, like, the left-wing podcasting, <laughs> like, economy, <Yes. laughs> you know, whatever, which is essentially, like, 90% Patreon right. subscriptions. <laughs> but, like, right, there are, like, we're sort of just, I feel, as far as, you know, the culture, the left culture, uh, <laughs> left culture worker as I am, I guess, <laughs> Um, <laughs> I feel fucking weird saying that. <laughs> um, like, you know, you have like the really big left wing media people, like, I mean, just like there's Chapo Trap House, for example, who make like a shit ton of money. And it, this is not me like shaming them, like, oh, you should be giving me like some of your money or something like that. But it's like, we're sort of like allowing these platforms like Patreon to sort of like administer that is the organization. It's Patreon, yes. the platform. Yeah, it is. And we're not allowed, we're not like creating any sort of like shared infrastructure for preventing the things that, that like you're talking about. It, can I just uh, jump in for a second on this topic of Patreon as the organization? I think it's it's very strange how um, like essentially these pseudo political organizations, these like media companies that are setting a, uh, a an agenda, right? Give you an analysis saying this is the person to vote for, this is the protest to attend, this is the activity, the political action to take, whatever. Um, it is very strange that, you know, this thing is built on uh, Patreon without, you know, anywhere else to go uh, from it. Uh, so I, it, what is um, useful uh, to move those groups of people to have these new um, subcultures and, and communities that are collecting online is that, um, as I've learned through Do Not Research, which begins as Patreon into a Discord, into a podcast, and now is a whole variety of, you know, hundreds of contributors, um, organizing cross platforms with a NFT as your membership card is actually a really useful thing because, you know, otherwise it results in me having 
say, 150 row spreadsheet with points of contact across seven different platforms, uh, you know, on Venmo, PayPal, Instagram, Discord, email, uh, well, whatever. So yeah, yeah, the, the ability to organize big groups of people independent of platform infrastructures could be really, really valuable for, uh, you know, calling on people to undertake a specific action and so on. Did you use um, you used NFTs for Do Not Research already? No, no. Well, this is, um, we do it for channel. So there's uh, the channel season zero NFT will port you into uh, the discords and the RSS feed. Um, but for that is that is one of the things that we will eventually release is um, we may end up using guild.xyz as the infrastructure for portable membership because they've done a really great job making those tools. But um, it just it's it is, I mean, at this point, many, many hours of uh, attending to spreadsheets to have points of contact for people. And yeah, a lot of administrative work that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm, so I'm I'm using a uh, guild right now for bread chain as a way to sort of keep up with like mm. membership within within uh that but indeed like and how has that has it's been working I, successfully it's you still enjoy early that? like the only thing we've yeah. only been playing with it we only have for example if you're in the crypto leftist discord then and you are have one connected your wallet with the guild and you maybe right, purchased right. one of the nfts related to the bread chain um mirror for the articles that we published or something like that uh then you'll get a, a role uh, also, if you mint or if you bake uh, at least 10 bread in our crowd staking application, which you should go do if you haven't done that yet, um, then you'll also get a role in there if you connect with the guild. Mm -hmm. So we're just, it's sort of like I'm still just playing around with it in sort of non consequential ways as a kind of experimentation ground. But I think there is a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of potential that, you can, that, that we can do with it. I mean, the one thing we do have is, I think, a, a token gated channel like only for people, just for bread holders. So if you did, if you've done at least 10 bread, then you're a bread holder uh, and you have an extra channel. It's like very non-consequential, but like mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the, the beginnings, it's like the, you know, the germinating seeds of something that could be a lot more interesting uh, if you were more creative. And also if I had more time to think about and, and do all the things that you could possibly do with that. Uh, but indeed, like right now, I just have I, I just use Patreon and I'm kind of I just rely on Patreon to handle everything for me because I, I don't want to add any more platforms. I don't want to like I'm trying to like keep it just at Patreon. And then whenever I want to make that switch, I'll make that switch. But at the moment, just keeping it there just to keep it simple for me. Yeah, yeah, I want to do um, because I think I, I haven't totaled up. I'm going to do an update for uh, I'm on Patreon as well. Uh, I, I should mention in case that wasn't uh, explicitly said before. Um, and that is a, a very kind of easy way to have like basically a paid newsletter. Um, you can send information to to all the people at once. But um, there are certain limitations to it. Indeed, um, yeah. That are, you know, just a technical question of like, it's difficult to port people over from having a Discord role into um, a private RSS feed. Like you can't actually connect those things. You have to connect it through Patreon. And it's just, um, it's, you kind of get locked in, you know? <laughs> so there's limitations to what you can do for people um, and who you can invite into a community without having to send them through Patreon and, and all of that stuff. Uh, but I want to eventually... I mean, we're at the very early stages of this, but I kind of feel like the way that internet and cultures in major metropolitan cities have uh, unfolded in the last few years is that um, people are more highly attuned to specific communities that um, have, you know, relatively more niche interests and um, to do pop-up events, for example, like I would, I would love to have a system where your membership to this organization is extremely affordable. It's just a five dollar thing to get in, um, and that gives you access to all these online communities. So you're getting the people who really care about the thing. Five dollars is a very affordable price, but it keeps away the people who are just there to troll or don't really care about it. And then that NFT brings you through all of the platforms, the RSS feed, uh, entry to uh, private events like physical IRL events where that's your, you know, as if you were showing up to a club that was a members only night. Uh, all of those things become, um, I think, very, very interesting for this new period of uh, creative life in, in the cities where we don't have the same infrastructure of tiny uh, galleries and project spaces that were there when I was uh, coming up in the city like, you know, 10 plus years ago. Uh, it's just 
you know, much less affordable to be able to have no one has a spare room in New York. There's not apartment galleries anymore. So um, I think one of the answers to that is to organize these digital communities and then to have these IRL pop up events where people get to meet each other and so on. So, yeah, I think that's going to become um, one of the ways that these tools get utilized to uh, to better degrees. Right. And just like Matt, like being able to do that collectively with other with like other like-minded people and to be able to like encode uh, a type of uh, like solidarity. So like one of the, one of the concepts that I'm playing around with through bread chain is the idea of solidarity primitives. So like taking this idea of financial primitives that, that DeFi uses as like, you know, money Legos or whatever. Um, but instead automating the kind of like solidarity that you could do with, with that same infrastructure, um, I think would be very interesting and, you know, if, you know, big, bigger uh, left-wing media companies or groups had done that from the start, then there potentially would have been like a much larger, like more resilient uh, network, media network, or that could sort of like have the resources to spin off sort of other types of collective endeavors. But at the moment, it's sort of like, I not not that I'm like I, I I don't believe in like shaming people what they do for their money but like we don't know what like these people do what people do with their money and maybe like it actually they want to do something good with it they just they don't know what to do with it because they're alone it's their money and they can't do it individually like Hassan Abi is like a millionaire but like what is he gonna do with his money like I mean maybe he's doing he probably is doing something good with it but I I can't say like that for sure well I, I mean I I do think it's also for from the left perspective, um, the left media perspective, it looks like these brands are enormous. These like big channels that are, you know, you just look at the breakdown of earnings on all of these, you know, uh, big platforms, Twitch, Patreon, whatever. And then it's like, oh my God, it's like a hundred to one, a thousand to one, the people at the very top. And then this just yeah. infinite, you know, uh, uh, struggle rappers, as they call them on SoundCloud, trying to <laughs> promote your mix. Um, but uh, in the scope of, you know, versus MSNBC or Fox News or of whatever, course, these are like course. drops in the bucket. They're not even visible. You yeah, know, we're indeed. comparing yeah. like, Mars and Jupiter. We're not comparing Mars to Earth. You know, these are things that are just in quantitatively different categories. So if, you know, what came from these things after a few years of, of running it was like, uh, you know, sufficient investment to start a new media network um, that had left wing messaging that was accessible and then reached the necessary audiences, that would be totally sufficient to me. But yeah, at the moment, it does seem like... Um, there's not a new vision beyond just the infinite treadmill of podcasting and content creation, <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is, I think, uh, in, in, an insufficient vision for what these things should be. Right. Because, you know, as one would imagine, like parties of the past where you have a political party and then they make the newspaper and the newspaper sends the message out to the people on the street, people on the street find the newspaper, then find the organization. Like this is what media is attempting to rebuild. This is the whole point of why uh, people with political inclinations care about media is to eventually build the coalition to see the, to create the change that they want to see. So um, yeah, I do think we have to consider it in, in those cases. I think maybe uh, Jacobin is about the closest thing to uh, uh, understanding that pipeline of politicization, informing people, but essentially Jacobin is, um, I think, uh, creating discursive and intellectual pressure on academics, journalists, uh, consultants, things like that. It's not focused at the, you know, I want the thing that has the cultural soft power and the influence to hit those kids at like age uh, 16 when they're they're getting into politics in a more serious way and they're starting to care about these things. And they're getting a lot of like basically right-wing nonsense and confused ideology in their newsfeed. I want something that can compete with that and can win over their hearts and minds. Uh, so I would be I would be happy to see that happen in the next few years. Um, I, I don't know if anyone is thinking... Teen Jacobin. In this kind of big... Uh, teen <laughs> Jacobin. Uh, I, I don't know. That sounds... I think... Would it work? Would it work? I mean, I, don't I think, think so. they would need a, definitely a, a rebranding. But... I mean, to, to, to your point, that is... <laughs> Team Jacobin is really funny. <laughs> uh, um, um, that, that, that's sort of like, I think how I felt with what I... Like, that, that's a whole, like, reason why I started Bread Chain a bit is just like, hmm. I can't just pot... I can't just, like, talk about it. Like, 
especially in this like weird niche where like a lot of people don't at, at, at the surface don't like what I'm doing or what I'm about, that there is like, like there has to be a pipeline from like, listen to the thing, be inspired by the thing and then go do the thing. Like there has right, to be like right. that pipeline. And that's sort of, there needs to be some sort of like ecosystem of different actors. Like it's not about like, we need to create one funnel to do, you know, everyone goes here, but that there's like, where people can come in and like find their place in the ecosystem. Well, it's got to lead to something because I think what we're seeing now with these big uh, media brands on of the left uh, uh, persuasion in, in the um, the political landscape is that they've devolved into fandoms, and the people who spend a lot of time in there are actually not interested to do the political work or to have their you know difficult conversations. They evolve very brittle worldviews where. Um, their ideas don't stand up to the test of reality if they go into debate with someone who has a different uh, you know, framework or a set of ideas or a different background. They immediately get very upset and they kind of can't communicate the talking points. Um, and th that is just not like doing the important work that needs to get done. And that's um, essentially you're talking about an adult babysitter that keeps you company. You know, this mm. is not a political education anymore. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as people who see some potentials in this type of media work to build the infrastructure to then create, you know, in my case, it's an arts organization. It's not a political movement at all. But, uh, you know, the idea that like a political organization can be literally an email list or a uh, arts organization can be an email list, or, um, you know, a, a fandom can be an email list. Like, these are the same tools, and there's a lot of implications. So experimenting with that infrastructure now to find out, um, you know, how, how can you actually organize and administer these things is, I think, quite important work. Yeah. So I, I think one of the obstacles in, like, in that vision, I think, <laughs> a big part of that is the sort of, like, politicization of aesthetics of like certain aesthetics um especially mm -hmm. if if we want to put forth the case that like hey maybe some crypto tools could be pretty useful in these particular situations in which um or contexts that we have issues in context in which we have issues in and we can sort of like build something better out of that um is that you know i mean there is like like for example if you create an nft organization nft based membership organization and then the the first thing people like someone on the left is going to say ah well you're you're creating exclusivity you're like doing this exclusive thing that like is inherently bad as if like we don't do exclusivity already at this point on on the left all the time anyways um and that, as if we don't want exclusivity in some contexts yeah, it's like I mean, what what kind of exclusivity is it? Like, cost is it a thousand dollar membership to like mint the NFT? Is it five dollars? Is it like right. I the mean, details are never discussed. You it's probably want to a... exclude some people from like, yeah, I want to exclude um, libertarians and anarcho capitalists from the organization. <laughs> there's like there, there's barriers to entry to create, uh, you know, because more things can happen when you have a community of like minded people that necessarily excludes some and includes others. Um, but that is just not a sufficient criticism to say that something is exclusive. And so, so like, but like these types of like pseudo political aesthetic things are going to get in the way. I think just inherently, it already is. So like one of the, another reason why I reached out is also because I listened to a recent podcast episode that you did where you interviewed uh, Young Chomsky. I think he's like the, the producer of uh, True Anon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, you guys talked about sort of like his, his interests in particular in like fitness culture um, or in fitness and the culture around that, which has this sort of like implied right wing political aesthetic to it, even though it's like kind of. I mean, from probably our point of view, it's an extremely silly thing for like people on the left to sort of like to think about people who do who like fitness as like inherently going to be these like, you know, proto fascists or, or whatever else. It, it just kind of shows this tendency to kind of like seed space that we you talked about earlier of of kind mm. of like the political aestheticization around something as simple as just like working out or like fitness, right. which we also see, of course, yes. in crypto. But I thought it was a, a, a really interesting topic, like specifically fitness. Is it, I mean, of course, that is interesting, but also like how it relates to, I mean, so many other things that, that seems to be just like this huge obstacle that needs to be somehow overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you try to do the, um, you realize how much you're working against the grain of social media and um, assumptions and all sorts of things when you do this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, this has been a recurring interest for me of like 
finding more or less, as I said before, these issues that when they're sliced uh, along the lines of like right left politics can sometimes end up on the wrong side. And uh, that is for whatever reason, becomes taboo, difficult to talk about. And, um, you know, my assertion has always been that this is the most necessary thing to talk about because those are the people who you should be fighting to win over. And, you know, I think what we're looking at now, certainly with the American left and uh, a lot of the, the, the way that the media discourse functions is that these are, you know, increasingly narrow slices of <laughs> the rest of like... Uh, the coalition. It's, it's you know, you, you very quickly work your way back where it's like, okay, anything attached to Web3 is uh, evil financial capitalism. Anything attached to fitness is like evil uh, proto-fascism. Anything attached to somebody getting paid for their work is like commodifying your uh, yourself. So, you know, you just infinitely retreat into this space that is uh, extremely punishing, broadly unappealing to most people. And um, I just don't see it building the necessary coalition that is required for a majoritarian democracy. Like the, the point of media is to do outreach. And, you know, instead we're in this extreme position of retreat where the point of media seems to be in many cases on the left to like punish people who think differently from you rather than try to convince them that you're right. And um, those do just, they just don't create very strong belief systems where a lot of times, you know, left-wing rhetoric and ideas, uh, it just feels very alienating. And, and, you know, people have not heard this before. They don't know how to understand it. Not everyone has, um, you know, a, a PhD in reading Judith Butler. And, <laughs> you know, sometimes um, there's a necessary outreach of like meeting people where they are. So a lot of people are interested in in fitness. Uh, I think there's real clear opportunities that you are unhealthy from the food that you eat, which is produced by, you know, having um, a lack of regulation and a, a, a food industry that is run through uh, a profit motive where they put very cheap uh hydrogenated oils into everything, which makes you unhealthy and sleepy all the day, all day. And um, then you have to pay for it because you have a private healthcare system and you don't have a national health service to, to foot your bill. So you're getting kind of <laughs> screwed at the grocery store and then screwed at the doctor's office. And it, all those sorts of things um, are real opportunities to, to make an inroad into someone's um, idea of how the world should function politically. But it's like, stopped at this aesthetic pursuit of like, you know, things that look masculine or uh, involve lifting weights, uh, or are like superficial. Um, you know, that's like, uh, on the other political side for some other reason. Uh, yeah. So I, I want to talk to the people who have, are on a different side of that, um, that idea and to highlight those, those things. And I think that will help to redraw some of the lines. Yeah, uh, for these issues. I mean, to me, it's 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 annoying this type of kind of policing. Whenever we already know that kind of like these very far right wing white supremacist groups, like they they are the ones going into like maybe these fitness groups or like you know these interest groups that are apolitical, per, like on the surface or whatever, and right. they go and and politicize it or like I think what it is as well. I mean maybe I'm afraid to do this, but like to bring in a little bit of Deleuze, but it's like, it's this territorialization. It's like, this is like the territory of, of the right. Uh, and then the left is kind of like, oh, they said that's the territory of the right. So therefore that's, that's a right wing thing to do now. That's just, right. which I think is kind of what happened with, with, with crypto. And this is kind of like a, a downstream effect of, I think what you mentioned before, but just like the doomerism of sort of like being a, uh, millennial and caring about politics in this day and age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's very, it's, um, it's a little disappointing. I mean, I have, uh, now I think enough of a following that kind of enjoys these things and likes to play with these topics that I've cultivated very intentionally. Um, but in the broader left, these are, you know, really ideas that are <laughs> marginalized and, and frowned upon. Um, but I think, you know, there's uh, there's all sorts of ways where these things connect unexpectedly. And I, I think that is actually the work of what media should be doing, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, we have to try and stay to some degree ahead of the, the curve to like shape the discourse in certain directions. And so uh, I inevitably find myself drawn to those things. <laughs> um, 
which is i don't know maybe you know the the right the the people that we are competing with for members of those groups of like apolitical you know um say like a group of gamers or a group of people who lifts weights and then you can enter into those communities and then recruit people to your ideas and all of a sudden it sets a narrative that well you know from the very beginning these gamers were beyond help and it was just toxic masculinity and right. they were wretched fascists from the very beginning <laughs> they were when they were political 14 year old gamers <laughs> yeah they came out of the womb as terrible unsavable people and I, I don't know i think that's why the dkp argument is so uh important because yeah. it's like there were all sorts of opportunities to set a narrative about what these communities could be and you're just if we're fixated on the rhetoric of what they say we're ignoring that they've built these cooperative models that are mm -hmm. like that's that's how all of those communities are organized dkp is i want to say it's like 80, 90% of, it's a little bit different now because there's been so many patches to the game just for the fucking nerds out there. But at, at that time, during the peak of when World of Warcraft was the most popular game in all of history, 80, 90% of the guilds were organized through DKP in these cooperative, you know, socialist models. So the idea that like, you know, they were wretched, uh, racist, bigoted people from the very beginning is uh, something that the media has seeded and now what happens quantitatively if you look at these spaces of um, there's a few studies uh, about Reddit communities that are, you know, decried as being uh, a far right space is that just quantitatively, if you watch the membership, once that piece hits the media, a whole bunch of new members influx to the community because they're going there to find that thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this, in these examples, we're watching media kind of, set the reality they're hyperstitioning it if you will <laughs> uh because that is not actually you know there's an element of that in the community yeah. and then by setting the narrative saying that this is the way that this thing is you then attract all the people who want that and then you you create that uh that reality unfortunately so yeah i think as people who care about media and setting narratives that we have to uh you know look at some of these issues that are contested make the case and then um yeah, yeah. Hopefully that has some effect uh, further on downstream. Yeah, I mean, just to take the example of me, like I, I posted the um, the interview from Richard Wolf in the r slash cryptocurrency subreddit. It wasn't that, it wasn't 100% people were like shitting on me. It, like there was a lot of people who were saying like, yes, this is amazing. Or like, you know, like, oh, that's interesting. Like there were, there were people who then like gained, in, like I every once in a while will like, kind of, if, if one of these kind of news articles pops up, I post it in that, that subreddit and then and then i just always i like you know i try to comment like my subreddit sort of in the comments for like people to find a way to like you know to, to like come, oh, come yeah, to mind yeah. like absolutely um so like that's that's kind of how my very small attempt at trying to like contest this type of like space one small example of, of many things but like I mean, I imagine you already agree that like the left should be contesting like these types of political aesthetics in, in the crypto space. But I was curious, like if you had any thoughts on like how to do it, like what if you have any like thoughts on like from like researching these different online communities, are, are there any like particular strategies that you that you think are could be good? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for um, I'm just going to take my project as the example here, if that's OK. But um, people are kind of allergic to uh, anything that mentions blockchain Web3 um, just on the face of it because they've had some bad interactions in the past or like seen stuff they don't like. So I think what I'm kind of uh, waiting for is that at a certain point, um, having a wallet is going to become very normalized and it, you know, I won't have to tell people, okay, well, just go get a MetaMask so that you can hold this NFT and then that'll make the coordination of our, or, or, of our community much easier. Um, I think the way to do it is kind of this example of like saying X and doing Y where the technology is going to work seamlessly and you won't have to say the words blockchain or Web3. It's just like, oh, here's your membership card. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, this is not attached to a controversial subject. They're seamlessly using the tech and um, they're kind of enjoying the results and that they have, you know, frictionless membership across all these different platforms. So that's, I think that's kind of the thing that I'm waiting for at the, the moment is that uh, eventually the infrastructural element is just so compelling in its use case 
that it doesn't matter what you call it. And then shortly after that, people are like, oh, wait, I was using an NFT membership this whole time? You mean to tell me <laughs> that I was... <laughs> I was burning I was the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> I personally <laughs> vaporized every molecule in the fucking ocean. Yeah, yeah, there's just... It's a desert of salt. That's all that's left, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I think that will that will kind of be it. So, you know, if you... um. Just to, to give like a, a silly example, um, if you attach like a Discord role to all of these things, um, and then having the Discord role automatically airdropped an NFT to your connected wallet, and nobody knew they were working, like they didn't have to go through blockchain to click a mint button, um, I think people would be very happy with that technology, and they they would only ask a question later. We didn't we didn't think that when we all signed up for these, you know. Uh, like the uh, Facebook and, and giant monolithic platforms, you know, like it's it's a matter of time, I think. The use case is the most compelling. I wonder how that would be possible, just like technically. that's It sounds kind of difficult if you want to have, I mean, I guess you just wouldn't have sovereignty over your wallets necessarily in the beginning where you probably have to rely well, on I'm, I'm giving a little bit of a fictitious example. Yeah, yeah. yeah cause you really, you really would have to, but I kind of imagine in this case that there's going to be all sorts of um, membership to digital communities will become so thoroughly normalized that you'll be like, you know, clicking a mint button. It's a little fetishistic even to like describe these things as, as tokens. And when you draw the analogy to having a membership ID, it's, it's, I think much simpler for people. Um, and, and, you know, maybe it says join instead of mint. And then like, you don't have the implication of like monetarist fetishism or, or whatever. Or follow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as like clicking a Patreon button. And that was kind of how we, you know, uh, conceived of it as channel of like season passes rather than a monthly membership. And yeah, I think that will be a uh, pretty commonplace in the near future. Yeah. Channel, by the way, is super interesting, which I think people should check out if, if they haven't already. I was like so excited when it came out because I thought like this is the example of way of, I mean, like I was talking about earlier, just like instead of having Patreon as the, as basically the infrastructure for your, for the left, <laughs> essentially, except where everybody else also uses it and they make all the money, um, where you <laughs> make the attempt at, you know, starting your own type of infrastructure for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it, it is you don't realize this unless you're in the position of being a content creator, but the infrastructure of Patreon is absolutely essential to how all these things organize, yeah. you know, literally how they're funded and also their distribution network. Um, and then there are, you know, just very clear technical limitations to what that can do. So uh, it has been, I will say though, um, the, the counterpoint to this is that the pressure from Web3 has successfully, I think, nudged Substack into offering different types of cross promotion and in mm. some cases payment splits yeah. that is not available on Patreon for whatever reason, which is very, very uh, puzzling to me. What I've seen is Patreon has now kind of, they, they've tried to promote collaborations like between creators. Yeah, tr but it's it's a meaningless collaboration because there's no payment split to the thing. It's like, guys, you can solve this. You can very easily solve this. <laughs> yeah, but I think- I think it's ideological. It's going to put, but it's going to put the pressure on them potentially if if there is some sort of uh, copyable, you know, yeah. infrastructure, like a smart contract code or, or, or infrastructure, or whatever, to create these types of content creator collaborations or whatever you call them. Um, I think it would put a lot of pressure on them. Probably. Yeah. I mean, it would seem rather intuitive that, you know, for the payment, for the payout schedule of this month, just, you know, riffing, I haven't thought yeah, this yeah. tremendously <laughs> through. If you do four podcasts a month, the payment schedule for this is that you take uh, a quarter of that and allot it to the people who show up on this episode. And it just, it, it seems, you know, pretty straightforward that um, there would be pretty direct financial incentives to uh, cross pollinate with people and, um, you know, equitable uh, splits and, and so on and so forth. I mean, I have in my inbox right now, an email from a recruiter at Substack. So <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, are you gonna be strategist at Substack? <laughs> is, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I technically have one, it's just a landing page. I mean, the thing that is kind of keeping me on Patreon is that there's going to be all of this drag in moving the organization because a lot of these tools are not implemented together. So if I had just totally riffing here an NFT, a tokenized membership of people who were subscribers, members of the, the media channel, um, I could just 
move over where my stuff was hosted and then serve it to the same token from uh, Substack. That would be preferable. And I wouldn't lose the Discord. I wouldn't right. lose the the roles. I wouldn't lose their, you know, all their points of contact, whatever. But um, yeah, maybe maybe something for the future. It's so, so like at the moment, it feels like kind of choose, like choose which, I mean, choose which kingdom you want to be ruled under. <laughs> So, you know, you have... Yes, so, it's feudal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, I mean, we, we, we talked about this over email a little bit, but um, I mean, there is this idea of like techno-feudalism kind of going around of that we're kind of like, uh, we are like the serfs on the uh, uh, the pastures of the kingdoms of Facebook and and Twitter and Patreon and whatever else. And they sort of, we sort of pay them rent through, our, through the money that they make off of our data. Um, and in some ways, this is like rhetorically, I think like, somewhat powerful like if like whenever you kind of like i think for me like the reason i chose patreon was i mean almost entirely just because I, that was like an agreed upon model on people on the left and i thought that that was my audience and so like i should just do the patreon route yeah um but now i'm i'm sort of I, you know there's i'm locked in to the kingdom of patreon like for this this service that if if i if i want um, the kingdom of patreon <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's funny Maybe to summarize just the roughly the triangulate the position that we're in now is that we would probably both agree that media is important for shaping uh, political ideation and then people make decisions based on that later on, right? Someone is going to have uh, an experience where they have to then make a choice between, you know, on a political issue or um, whether to uh, support an organization or something like that. And then all of the messaging that they've received on the topic up until that point is going to inform the decision that they make. Yes, no, right, left, whatever. Um, and so at the moment, we're in this very weird position where we have, in my analysis, a extremely libertarian realization of how media should be funded in that it is only for profit. All of these, you know, quote, quote, left media channels are exclusively for profit. If any of them take donation to subsidize the cost of what they're doing, they are uh, counter revolutionaries now for what, it, for, I don't know, because people are fucking insane uh, as if we're, you know, pretend, LARPing that revolution is a real force. But um if they were to take a donation from a you know, philanthropist or a big donor, then they would be compromising their political ideals and you know maybe pulling their punches on some of the critiques later on. So what that has created is that um, rather than being able to take uh, you know certain creative risks and have very complicated conversations, the for-profit model of left-wing media, exclusively funded by crowd uh, subscriptions, has kind of nudged uh, the political education of the current moment into being something that is basically an adult daycare babysitter where a comedian sits with you and walks you through political topics and you have a very narrow understanding of the world that you are unable to communicate to people who come from other walks of life. So that for me is not an acceptable model for left-wing media. <laughs> you deserve better, listener. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think they do. Yeah. And so I see some potentials, you know, getting off of like this $5 model and, and other things too. So yeah, hopefully we can have some tools and, and funding structures that facilitate a better discourse and yield better political subjects at the end, better informed individuals. And yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's been great to have you. I think if people just look up Joshua Citarella, they should find you basically everywhere. It's the same across all the platforms, although I am shadow banned to shit. So good luck finding. Yeah, me. I heard. What <laughs> is that? What is what is the shadow banning thing? You gotta you gotta <laughs> check. You gotta type out my whole name on Instagram. It's actually I haven't I haven't gained like a follower in like I don't know like a year or something. It's insane. I'm I'm wow. just invisible. Yeah, yeah. Shadow banned. Uh, into oblivion so i technically exist but you can't find me so the the, the kingdom of instagram is uh <laughs> yeah the, i'm shadow banned in the kingdom of instagram so i'm trying to exit just let me exit that's all <laughs>
Cool. Well, thanks so much. And thanks yeah. for having me. This has been a blast. I've been looking forward to chatting with you and I've been uh, listening to the podcast and it's just, it's such a, a fun thing to go through these uh, insane zigzags of topics and it's, I find it very generative. So I've really enjoyed listening so far and I'm glad to finally come on. Nice. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you.